to give you this lecture today. Um, usually we give an introductory talk, which I'm not sure was given by Professor Karimurio, um, but uh, fourth year goes rather fast. Your exposure in ophthalmology has had to be adjusted given the circumstances that we are facing, COVID and all. Um, so for your colleagues who are in sixth year, we mainly had, they had a real pro proper clinical exposure in fourth year. Uh, in the sixth year, we were mainly doing tutorials online because they had already done the skills of history taking and examination. We may have to play it differently this time, and I'm happy for suggestions. Um, we might just do more online for you and hope that by the time you're in sixth year, things are better so you can have a more clinical exposure. Uh, but that's what seems feasible for now, but I'm happy to take suggestions through your class rep. Um, today's lecture is rather long, um, but I've tried to edit it down from what I gave last year uh, to something a bit shorter. And for your comfort, I will actually share these slides out um, through your class rep email. So if can, you could just send me your email or let me have yes, it the class email. I'll send those out. Okay. So my intention is to just do a recap of the anatomy of the conjunctiva. Um, which you already done in, uh, you've already done in first year and you've satisfied the examiners. Um, then we'll go a little over the functions of the conjunctiva. Um, it's important to know what it normally does so that when it's sick, we know what it's not doing. Then I'll talk a little about the types of pathological insults that the conjunctiva is susceptible to. Uh, then how the conjunctiva responds to inflammation, which is mainly a revision of things you've done in pathology in the third year. And uh, finally discuss some common conjunctival diseases in Kenya. This, this is not exhaustive in any way, uh, but we picked out what would be common in this country so that when you're working, you know what to expect. The conjunctiva you are told is this thin translucent uh, mucous membrane that covers the eye. And uh, what we call the white of the eye as you see in this picture, looks white because it's covered by a translucent membrane called the conjunctiva, which is like cellophane paper. You can see right through it. Uh, it's got some blood vessels, which normally you should not see. Uh, so when you start to see them, something is wrong. Um, it generally covers the corneal epithelium. So in a transverse section, you can see that that's the corneal epithelium. So it goes from just where the corneal epithelium tra trans it transits and covers the bulbar conjunctiva, a bit of the eyeball. And then it goes into the phonics there and then covers the inner part of the upper lid. And the same pattern happens on the lower lid. So sometimes we like to describe it as the bulbar conjunctiva on the eyeball, which is what you see when somebody's eye is open, as in that picture. And then there is the palpebral conjunctiva, which is on the eyelid. And then there is the phonicial conjunctiva, which is in the phonesis, which you normally don't see until you evacuate the lid. Lymphatic drainage goes mainly to the preauricular and the submandibular nodes. And that's important because we know that if there's inflammation in the conjunctiva, then you might get regional lymphadenopathy in those areas. Embryology, um, very briefly, it originates from the surface ectoderm, uh, which is the same as the cornea and the limbus. And some of the applications of these things is, if generally people are from the same origin, they're likely to have the same problems. So you might find a correlation between corneal diseases and conjunctival diseases. Uh, remember the surface ectoderm also produces your skin. And so don't be surprised if you find that your conjunctiva is also affected when you have some skin diseases. So some allergic skin diseases like eczema will also be associated with, for example, allergic conjunctivitis. Um, the conjunctiva also manifests systemic diseases. 
and uh, those will be seen as jaundice when you start going to the wards. I'm sure you've seen it in pediatrics, in medicine, uh, in sickle cell disease, and things like vitamin A deficiency. Yeah, and I think you'll have lectures on vitamin A deficiency later on uh, in the schedule. Histology, generally it is as stratified squamous epithelium, which overlies loose connective tissue. So on the slides there, you see a histological section on the left and an artist's impression of the same histological section on the right. And so you can see that it's a stratified epithelium. The lower cells tend to be flattened. Um, I mean, tend to be more, sorry, they become more cuboidal. I don't know why my point is in moving. They're more cuboidal cells. They start to flatten as you go up towards the surface. Can't seem to be able to move this point out very well. Um, that's better. And then the, on the surface, the cells tend to flatten. So you have this loose connective tissue here. Um, on the stratif on the palpebral conjunctiva, you tend to transition from the stratified to an unkeratinizing epithelium. Um, you also have goblet cells, which are those whitish looking cells you see there. They produce mucus. A few melanocytes, uh, more particularly in uh, African people, especially around the limbus. And uh, you might have lymphocytes and dendritic cells. If you look at the transition from the cornea on the right to the conjunctiva on the left around the limbus, you may notice that the conjunctiva here tends to start thickening more and quite thick around the limbus, then tends to thin out again on the side covering the bulbar conjunctiva. So what are the functions of the conjunctiva? The main function is that it actually attaches um, because the word conjunctiva actually is derived from Latin meaning for binding together. So it actually attaches the eyeball um, to the eyelids. Uh, the other most important function is actually to produce mucin for the tear film. Uh, the tear film has three layers. The inner layer is mucin, then it has a thick middle layer which is watery and the superficial layer, which is oily, that comes from the meibomian gland. So the mucinous layer helps to stabilize the tear film onto the eyeball. Otherwise, your eyes will get very dry. Uh, a smooth tear film is really important for refraction um, so that there's no scattering of light. Uh, the conjunctiva also has an important immunological defense function. It has secretory IgA. And as we mentioned in the histology section, it has lymphocytes, it has dendritic cells for presenting antigens to lymphocytes, I mean, to antibodies. So it's also got a very important immunological defense mechanism. And as you'd expect, you would also have immunological diseases affecting the conjunctiva. What are the types of pathological insults? Uh, because you've seen from that picture that the conjunctiva is exposed to the atmosphere. So it's very vulnerable to external influences, radiation from the sun, uh, radiation from x-rays, if you're in the radiology department, uh, from heat and wind, you can get very dry. It's exposed to foreign bodies in the environment. So when there's a dust storm, sand and pieces of sticks or dust and stones can go into your eye. You also have bugs flying around. And uh, now in the COVID epidemic, you know that you can get COVID from exposure to viral coronavirus particles uh, getting through your eye, which is why we advise people not to rub their eyes if you can. Then chemical irritation, smoke, fumes, uh, particularly in urban areas or next to highways. Um, mascara, some people may take offense that we call it a pathological insult because it's a cosmetic, but basically these are chemicals that are applied on the eyelid, but can end up getting into the conjunctiva. And we do see patients who have mascara staining. Because it's also connected to the systemic blood circulation, conjunctiva does have a blood supply. And it's also connected to the immune system, like we said earlier. Then you can imagine that if you have drug reactions, which are systemic, they can affect the conjunctiva. And we'll talk about those uh, later in the lecture. <laughs> 
allergic reactions, both local and systemic, and again, we'll talk about those. Autoimmune reactions, metabolic diseases, will not cover these. Amyloidosis, cystinosis, and things like that can also affect the conjunctival. So broadly speaking, you could divide conjunctival diseases into four groups. Uh, infections, allergic diseases, immunobulous diseases, and tumors. So the top group, infections and allergic diseases, we'll discuss them together under a broad term called conjunctivitis, because these are inflammations of the conjunctiva. So going forward, the rest of the lecture, I'll cover conjunctivitis broadly. Then I'll look at some immunobulous diseases, which are common, like Stevens-Johnson uh, syndrome, and then some common tumors that you need to be aware of. When I'm discussing conjunctivitis, I'll be very broad, but there will be some important specific conjunctival diseases which will be covered separately in another lecture. That's neonatal ophthalmia, uh, trachoma, and then vitamin A deficiency. Um, it's not an infection, but it's a nutritional deficiency that presents on the conjunctiva. So there'll be separate um, talks, or at least they'll be included. Now with the change in timetables, we've had to amalgamate some of them. But there'll be other lecturers who will cover that subject. So on to conjunctivitis. Uh, from your pathology class, I'm sure you remember the five cardinal signs of inflammation, uh, redness, heat, swelling, pain, and loss of function. And when you think of the conjunctiva, uh, this is pretty much what we see. Um, conjunctivitis is probably one of the most common eye disorders, disorders you'll ever treat as a general physician or as a general medical officer. Uh, we tend to think of acute conjunctivitis or chronic conjunctivitis, and the time difference is really uh, three to four weeks. So if you have this lasting less than four weeks, we call that acute. Uh, chronic conjunctivitis lasts th uh, last three or four weeks, yeah, more than three or four weeks. Uh, in terms of etiology, uh, you can think broadly of infectious and non-infectious causes. Um, the infectious causes, again, from microbiology now, you know there's bacteria, viruses, parasites, and fungi. The non-infectious ones can be allergic, toxic, and systemic reactions. And we're going to discover, discuss uh, these ones in a little more detail. So the common infections, um, bacterial conjunctivitis, uh, there are different entities of bacterial conjunctivitis. But the most common typical red eye you will see is a simple bacterial conjunctivitis. Um, then there's a rare one, which is gonococcal, um, that will be covered, I think, in a separate lecture in pediatrics, um, pediatric ophthalmology lectures. Gonococcal conjunctivitis can also occur in adults, although we teach it in uh, pediatric uh, lectures. Uh, it's a dramatic condition, purulent conjunctivitis. Uh, it's an STI. Viral conjunctivitis is probably also very common. Uh, adenovirus being the most common, uh, molluscum and happy simplex, and I'll show you some pictures of those. And then there is chlamydia, which I will not cover today because we've said we are going to cover neonatal ophthalmia and trachoma uh, in a separate lecture. So that is simple bacterial conjunctivitis, usually acute, tends to start in one eye, and then within three to four days affects the other eye. And so you see this massive, you know, the cardinal signs of inflammation we talked about, redness, swelling, sometimes you touch and they feel warm, there's discharge coming out of there and there's loss of function. Um, and some of the loss of functions we talked about is things like duplication, immunological function, and even attaching the eyeball to the eyelids. So you, call, you always tend to see a lot of sagging, uh, injection, some kind of purulent discharge there that you see in the phonases. Viral conjunctivitis, on the other hand, tends to be quite dramatic. There are different types. You can have this subconjunctival hemorrhage. Which ten, generally, when you see this, there's usually an epidemic somewhere. If I saw this patient, I'll want to know that somebody else at your workplace, in your school, or in your home have a red eye because it tends to be transmitted through formites. And we tend to get occasional outbreaks, you know, uh, even in the city. I might see a few people within a period of a week. And when I discuss with colleagues, they say, yeah, you know, I'm also seeing a lot of people with this uh, viral conjunctivitis. We'll talk about this uh, shortly. I 
I have put this because I will share the slides later for you to read, but because it's a long lecture, allow me to skip the details of these patterns of viral conjunctivitis, but I have put them there for you to read uh, when I share them out, uh, so that you're aware of the different types of viral conjunctivitis. Why do I think this is important? When you work in casualties, and particularly those who work in the cities, casualties like in Nairobi Hospital and Aga Khan, you tend to see a lot of these viral conjunctivitis. And sometimes they look very similar to a bacterial conjunctivitis and you're not sure, is this viral, is this bacterial? So I've given you some detailed info there which you can read later, uh, but I chose to help you out in that way by showing a table which will come in another slide or two, uh, broadly how you can tell whether this is bacterial, viral or something else. Again, some details about types of allergic conjunctivitis. Um, they can be acute, can be seasonal or perennial, um, vernal or atopic. These are all different types that if you want a little more detail, you can, but for your comfort, generally they all present the same. The difference simply being some people will get episodes of acute attacks. Others will tell you whenever it's hot and dusty, I tend to get these seasonal uh, allergic reactions. And in Kenya, this is generally in the hot and dry months. So somewhere about December to about March. Then after that, I don't see my patients till the following year. Perennial means it's there throughout the year. So again, this is for your consumption later on. We don't want to dwell too much on it right here. But one of the features of allergy particularly is papillae, which you see here on the top left, small little tiny nodular swellings. Then you can have really giant ones. They look like cobblestones, these ones. And then you can have papillae on the limbus, which we call trantus dots. You see those white looking uh, spots? And generally people with allergies tend to have a hyperpigmentation of the conjunctiva. So you see a lot of melanosis there. And uh, this is quite typical. You'll see on little kids sometimes have a lot of allergy, darkening of the eyelid skin, Darkening of the limbus, it doesn't look white. They tend to have this brownish looking eyes. And in terms of presentation, the most important thing I want to mention here is that allergic conjunctivitis is probably the most common conjunctivitis you will treat of all the different types. It's a very highly misunderstood problem. You can imagine somebody who has eyes that constantly look like what you see on the bottom right picture. Um, Typically, because they're environmental, you see them in children who have just transitioned from primary school to boarding school and gone to a boarding school that's in a different environment from where they live. And so they always get these flare-ups of red eyes in form one, and the teachers get very agitated, the nurse gets very agitated, they call the parents, you know, come and fetch your child, the child is brought to the Nairobi or to wherever they live to see the doctor. And after two or three days, the redness clears. And you know, many of them are misunderstood as malingering. You don't want to be in school. How come you came home and your redness cleared? And when they go back to school within two or three days, the redness flares up again. And so the teachers start thinking there must be something you're doing to make your eyes red. Uh, if particularly is a rebellious or misunderstood type of child, it's very easy for people to think, you know, are you smoking something? Are you drinking something? Um, so it's a very misunderstood condition and can have a lot of uh, stigma attached to it. Uh, among adults, you can imagine, because we also see it, most allergy clears by 18 to 20, but in some people it persists uh, into uh, adulthood, although on a less severe scale. But I have seen adults who have this kind of persistent, you know, redness and you know, darkening of the eyes. And because they also have darkened leads, they tend to have this sleepy look. So picture a young person, you just got a job, and you always show up at the office in the morning with these red eyes and a sleepy look, and everybody's talking. Are you drinking? If it's a lady, are you married to some violent fellow or what's going on? So it's, it's a really stigmatized disease that's important to understand and just reassure people. So I spend a lot of time talking about this to teachers, particularly high school teachers, uh, 
and to parents of children who have this problem. Uh, some of them can get very complicated. Um, you can get uh, associated corneal disease, shield ulcers with allergy. You can have erosions and scarring of the cornea, although that is rare. So in general, <laughs> okay, could we mute if you're not listening to the lecture? Mrevi? So in general, the features of conjunctivitis, you can derive them from those cardinal signs of inflammation. Uh, the symptoms will generally be what patients complain about. My eye is watering a lot. I feel gritty, like there are particles in my eye, uh, stinging and burning, particularly for allergy, itching also for allergy. The cornea may be involved where they may say they have pain or are sensitive to light. And then you tend to have a discharge. And I think out of everything in this slide, the one place I would like you to pay attention to is this section on the discharge, because it gives you a hint as to the cause of disease. Generally, if there's a watery discharge, it's either viral or an acute allergy. If it's mucoid, you're probably drilling with a chronic allergy or a dry eye. Uh, if it's mucopurulent, you're probably dealing with bacteria or chlamydia. And if you see massive purulent discharge, you're almost always dealing with gonococcal conjunctivitis. You might have the cornea involved. I, I showed you some pictures just before. And then the other signs of inflammation that you see is injection or redness. Uh, some may look hemorrhagic, like the picture I showed you when we have epidemics. You may have uh, chemosis or edema of the conjunctiva. You might see membranes, and I'll show you some pictures later on. Um, infiltration and subconjunctival scarring, those are a lot more long-term features, and papillae and follicles, which I have shown you some pictures of. And remember also for infections, particularly, you might get lymphadenopathy uh, in the region that is drained. Uh, this is just a nice one for you once you start examining patients to know the patterns of conjunctival injection. You can have diffuse injection like you see here. Diffuse meaning it's everywhere. And usually that's what you get with typical conjunctivitis. You can have a mixed one where there's quite intense redness around the limbus, uh, but still involving other areas. And quite often that's usually foreign bodies or corneal ulcers. You can have ciliary injection, redness, which is primarily around the limbus. And as you go into the phonesis, it's quite clear. And this is quite typical of uveitis, scleritis, and keratitis. And then you can just have a corneal one here, which is quite often what we see with herpes and acne rosacea. <clears throat> so again, once you receive these notes, this will be a good table just to get familiar with. Uh, it broadly gives you some rough guideline of how to distinguish bacterial from viral, chlamydia, or allergic type of conjunctivitis. Um, again, I think allow me to skip this because we can't keep reading whole table cell after cell. But in general, I told you that the type of discharge here can be quite a good hint. If I see purulent discharge, bacterial, mucopurulent, chlamydia, watery, viral, ropey, stringy, thick looking white discharge is allergic and uh, in toxic antibiotics, you don't often have a discharge. Okay, so you can read this once you get those. Um, a nice one to get familiar with. How do you treat conjunctivitis? So again, broadly, bacterial conjunctivitis needs topical antibiotics. And typically, this would be three or four times daily for a week. And there is many available in the market, gentamicin, erythromycin, tetracycline, neomycin, and all those drugs that you see there. We only use systemic antibiotics for the really severe ones, gonococcal or neonatal. So most conjunctivitis, bacterial conjunctivitis, is treated with tropical medication. For chlamydia, I will not dwell on this because you'll have a lecture on trachoma, but we use azithromycin. There is now a topical preparation, but most azithromycin that's available in Kenya is actually oral. For viral conjunctivitis, as you'd expect, there's no specific treatment. Uh, except when we are sure it is happy simplex and happy zoster. And usually the hint for this will be in the pattern of ulceration on the cornea, 
or this uh, vesicular rash you get on the skin for zoster. And the treatment for that would be a cyclovir ointment, five hourly for two weeks. For all of them, we tend to give supportive treatment with topical lubricants. And sometimes you may give topical antibiotics if you are worried that this patient may get secondary infection. For allergic conjunctivitis, generally avoid the allergen if you can find what it is. Um, there are many tests some labs offer for you to know what you're allergic to. Are you allergic to pollen or to fibers? Or, you know, they go through all kinds of sensitization tests for you to identify the allergy. Those are good to do. But from my experience, I have often found, even if you tell somebody they're allergic to dust or they're allergic to some, you know, animal hair or something like that, where can you go really and avoid these things? It's, it's very difficult. Um, if it's in your house, you might want to change your fabrics for bedding, carpets, and if you have pets, maybe stop keeping them. Uh, but by and large, we find that most people in this country are reacting to pollen. Pollen from flowers, from dry grasses. And so typically that's where we tend to see it when maize and flowers are blooming quite uh, widely. Now, if those are environmental, you can't really avoid them. So I quite often will not stress people in going through those tests, uh, but if they really want to know, they're available. Uh, in terms of medications, uh, the safest and most frequently used are topical antihistamines and topical uh, mast cell stabilizers. Um, you can read the pharmacology of those, just remind yourselves, um, to stop the cells from degranulating and releasing all those uh, intermediaries of inflammation. We rarely need to use topical steroids. And actually, my general advice would be, leave the use of topical steroids to the ophthalmologist. For as a general medical officer, you can prescribe any of the others. And if you think this allergy is not improving or responding to your treatment, I much rather you referred to uh, the ophthalmology department for somebody to decide whether they need to be on steroids or not. Sometimes we combine with oral antihistamines because people with allergies sometimes will also have allergic rhinitis, allergic sinusitis, they'll have allergic dermatitis. And so for those you may need additional systemic treatment. Uh, we give subtarsal steroids for severe cases of allergy. We inject steroids under the tarsal conjunctiva. And of course, you can imagine that should best be done by an ophthalmologist. So this is just for you to know, not to do. For toxic conjunctivitis, usually will be artificial tears and then supportive treatment as is necessary. And we'll give some detailed talk about that, uh, about the use of steroids coming up shortly. Okay, so that was the big class of conjunctivitis. So I'll quickly go over immunobullous diseases, and then we still have tumors to go and hopefully have time for a few questions or comments at the end. So immunobullous diseases are acute uh, reactions of the skin and mucous membranes, uh, broadly classified as erythema multiforme, and they can involve the skin only, which is called erythema multiforme minor, or if it's the skin and mucous membranes, then it becomes erythema multiforme major, or what sometimes we like to call Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and uh, there's also an entity called toxic epidermal necrolysis. So Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis are just different degrees of the same disease. Um, toxic epidermal necrolysis being a much more fulminant and widespread reaction. So those are the ones we are going to discuss. There are others in this class, but we rarely ever see them. And uh, when you do, it will generally be in especially in internal medicine, when they present with other issues. So cicatricial pemphigoid and pemphigans vulgaris, uh, we, we are not going to discuss this, but you need to know that they belong to this class. So we'll talk a little more about the one that you're likely to see, which is Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Um, it's usually a reaction to drugs. Um, 10 is a more severe variant of the same. But as far as the eyes go, so just remember this is a systemic disease. So although I'm showing you a picture of the eye, you can imagine that this is happening to all the mucous membranes uh, of an adult uh, or whoever the patient is presenting with this disease. 
So you can see a lot of, you know, excoriation of the skin, typical signs of inflammation, swelling, redness, discharge, um, injection of the conjunctiva. There's lots of discharge on the eyelid here coming from the conjunctiva. Um, generally precipitated by various things. The most common ones we see uh, locally are reactions to drugs. Uh, but we do have uh, other organisms that can precipitate it. So most commonly in order, I listed those drugs in terms of how frequently we see them here. Uh, and so this is just anecdotal from my own observations of patients. The most common drug we tend to see is sulfonamides, septrine and drugs like that. Uh, anticonvulsants um, also cause this. Uh, I've seen people react to salicylates and penicillins, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you probably have or will see them. INH or isoniazid um, in TB treatment. And then lately with the use of antiretrovirals, we also do get some people who react this way. But remember, there are also organisms like happy simplex, streptococcus, adenovirus, mycoplasma that can cause those. Um, with HIV, now we are seeing a lot of this. So it's not something nice to be aware of. So like I said, it affects all the mucous membranes. And the presentation will be the same. This is bullous um, reaction on the mucous membrane. Uh, we, sometimes you'll have a lot of weeping or uh, weeping of these lesions when they burst and release the fluid. Um, I talked about membranes earlier on. So when you invert the lead, you see this thick yellowish looking membrane stuck on the conjunctiva. Uh, later on, you can get scarring. So the conjunctiva becomes very scarred. So the white material you see here is scar tissue, which is bad because now you restrict movement of the eye. The eye gets dry because the goblet cells here have been destroyed. <laughs> You can get metaplastic lashes. That is a lot of extra or accessory lashes. Now, the top right picture is a girl I saw in Dar es Salaam some years back uh, who had reacted to Fancida and had developed keratinization of the conjunctiva and the cornea. And so this scarring that you see here had actually happened not only in her phonesis, but right over the surface. You can see these eyes are actually stuck open in that position. They were not open because we were taking a picture. She walks around or was walking around like this. I'm not sure how she is today. Uh, she had been brought to a clinic where we were hoping to do corneal transplants. But clearly this is not somebody that you want to do a corneal transplant on. So we couldn't do anything to help her. Um, but that's how bad it can get. Um, Fancida was an old anti-malarial. I'm not sure if they use it anymore that had sulfurs. Treatment. Uh, the slides for treatment will be rather long, more for you who like to read notes. But in general, you want to re remove the drug that is causing it if you're able to find out. Supportive measures. Remember, it's a systemic disease. So hydrate those patients, check their electrolytes, check their nutrition. Uh, some of them can have the appearance of having burns. So they may even be kept in a burns unit. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether to use systemic steroids or not, although there are studies that suggest that um, using steroids in the short term helps to reduce mortality. Then the use of modern immunosuppressants like, like cytosporin and azithrom, uh, um, azathioprine, those are now increasingly being used. But again, this is not in the realm of a general medical officer. Um, these are patients probably being managed in ICU by the uh, internists and the intensive care people. Um, sometimes because of exposure of the skin by those blisters that rupture open, they might get secondary infections. So you give them prophylaxis. But again, remember the drugs we talked about that precipitate this reaction. So first, you don't want to give them whatever precipitated the reaction. And you also want to avoid this other class of drugs that you know may potentially cause another reaction so that we don't worsen an already bad situation. For the eyes, we tend to give them a lot of low, uh, artificial tears or topical lubricants. Um, the most common being uh, hypo, hypromelos, there is uh, cellulose. Um, then you prevent exposure by putting them on ointments or gels. Uh, we use topical steroids in these patients. Uh, cycloplegia, if they're in pain, like atropine, to make them comfortable. Those 
uh, adhesions I showed you that happen in the phonics, the fibrous bands are called symblepharon. Um, we used to treat these by breaking them with glass rods. Um, personally, I'm not sure that that was a good idea because we are not dealing with the cause of the inflammation. And maybe we did worse in scarring. So you'll not see this being done anymore. We give them scleral rings, which are like contact lenses to prevent adhesion between the bulba and the tussle conjunctiva. I peel the membranes when you can. And if you suspect infection, take swabs for microbiology. Uh, there's use of things like topical retinoic acid uh, on the eyes to help the conjunctiva recover. Contact lenses. And then my plastic colleagues now do mucous membrane grafting. And sometimes we may do keratectomies for scars. So that's it about the immunobulous reactions, uh, Stevens Johnson being the main one. This one I put in just for interest because some of you may work in hospitals near, especially near national parks. So if you work somewhere where there are tourists in the Mara or Savo, uh, somebody's going to show up one day with an Nairobi eye. Um, first of all, you need to know Nairobi eye is actually a misnomer. It's nothing to do with Nairobi. Um, it's a dermatitis that you get acute swelling of redness because of being bitten by this bug. And you know, I, I tend to see this in tourists. Um, red eye, swollen, uh, quite dramatic. And people used to associate it with the Nino floods, but I think it's just because there's a lot of water around for these bugs to, to, to live in. Um, the treatment is really avoid exposure to those insects. So we, by then it's too late, of course. But when they do come, we give them topical uh, steroids and sometimes oral antihistamines like cetirizine uh, would be enough. And if you're not sure, you could send them on to an ophthalmologist. I really wouldn't recommend you starting oral prednisone unless somebody is really showing uh, other systemic signs of the reaction. If they are starting to wheeze and have difficulty, uh, you better treat that with steroids. Good. And on to tumors. Tumors broadly can be benign, pre-malignant or malignant, and we'll try and go through this uh, in turn. So sorry, it's a bit of a long lecture, and please feel free to interrupt in between if you have any questions. Eh? Um, I tend to try to discuss tumors by focusing on the pictures rather than on the text. So you might see a lot of text in some slides, but don't be too worried. So part of my PhD work was actually centered on ocular surface squamous neoplasia. And so I looked at about 496 patients uh, in different centers in Kenya, and we looked at their histology. And for people who have conjunctival lesions, you can see 62% were benign and 37% or 38% were ocular surface squamous neoplasia. So the benign lesions you can see, the most common was pterygium, followed by actinic keratosis, nevi, papillomas, pyogenic granulomas, and the rest as you go down. Then we'll also show you some pictures of OSSN, which can present in different scales, but we'll talk about that coming. So pterygia are these wing-shaped lesions. They, they're shaped like the wing of an insect. And actually, you might see some patients with bilateral pterygia. So when you look at that triangular structure there, and imagine another triangular one here, it looks like the wings of an insect. So it's a wing-shaped growth, which extends onto the, from the conjunctiva onto the cornea. Uh, usually histology shows basophilic degeneration, and it usually occurs in older people, um, you know, 70s, 60s, thereabouts. I keep shifting as I get older. When I was 30, old was 50. Uh, and now I think old is 70. So, Swelling tends to be quite inflamed, can get very red, and generally does not need surgical intervention unless it's very big. Where very big is something that's growing onto the people. It can reach here, although they grow slowly uh, and obscuring the eye. Or sometimes because of the scarring here, they might cause astigmatism. Because it's mainly UV related, you can expect that we see them a lot in the tropics. 
So next time you go and visit some old people up country, just have a look at their eyes and you'll notice quite a few people have this. Uh, treatment is excision and to prevent recurrence, we use antimetabolites like 5 fu or mitomycin C. You can advance some conjunctiva or piece from there to here once you excise it to cover that gap, uh, or you can use a mucous mem amniotic membrane graft. Pinguecula are these yellowish growths that you tend to see in the conjunctiva. Uh, they look like they are fatty degeneration, fatty deposits, yellowish there, another yellowish one here. Usually not inflamed, although they might get inflamed sometimes, you get a pinguiculitis. We don't know what causes them, and actually they don't need treatment, but you'll have, especially ladies come when they have these things and they're very conscious about how they look. Um, you really don't need to treat them. If they're inflamed and there's a pinguiculitis, a topical steroid for four or five days should do it, and that's enough. Nevi, again, uh, quite common. If you start looking around, you'll see them. Brownish, elevated conjunctival lesions in an island that looks whitish, then you have this brown. Um, usually tend to occur in, they present about teenage, you know, around age 12 and start to grow slowly sometimes. Um, they don't often grow much, but when they start to grow rather fast or they start getting blood vessels that look injected, then you should be concerned that something is happening. Um, they can turn malignant in some cases, but that is very unusual. Most African patients, like this patient I had in my study, will have nothing to worry about. Uh, you can reassure them, and even if you have to do any excision, you can excise it to send it to pathology, uh, but often they don't need treatment. Papillomas, again, just looking at the pictures, um, you can have two types. You can have a flat kind or a pedunculated one that tends to this looks like it's sitting here, but actually can hang outwards like a rope, uh, which is why it's called pedunculated. The flat ones has the appearance of the surface of a cauliflower um, with a lot of blood vessels on it. Uh, as you can imagine from the name, they're associated with the human papilloma virus. Uh, in children, usually you have the low risk types. If I see this in an adult, these are usually the type 16, 18, and 33, which you know are associated with cervical uh, cancer. So if I saw this in a lady, I would excise them, but I would also advise them to go and have a pap smear done because you might just be having the same viruses uh, later on leading to human um, cervical cancer. Large lesions need to be treated by excision. Smaller ones, you could just observe and leave them. But when you do excise, they can recur. So to reduce the chance of recurrence, we usually again use uh, antimetabolites like 5-FU, mitomycin C, and there are also studies now describing the use of oral cimetidine to treat these lesions. Pyogenic granuloma. Um, that name is actually a misnoma. It's not a granuloma at all, um, because there's no pus, there's no granuloma. But typically, it's a large, fleshy, conjunctival lesion. Um, these were two patients I saw during that study that I was doing uh, when I was doing it for my PhD. Usually, there's a history of having had something growing on the eye that you excised. And the site where you excised, you get what appears to be a recurrence. And the recurrence happens fairly quickly, within two or three weeks. Uh, and in some cases, like this lady here, this patient below was a lady who we excised, she went back to Kisumu, and within two weeks, she came back with this massive swelling. Uh, it can look very dramatic and scary, uh, but relax, topical steroids is all you need. And if they don't respond to the steroids, you can re-excise them. Uh, but just for your information, this big looking one here disappeared after two weeks of topical steroids. So we didn't need to go back and re-excise the lesion. Um, somebody's asking, is it possible to get pterygium in a young age because of environmental factors? Yes. Uh, if, surgery, if, if surgery is done, is there a chance of recurrence of the same? Yes, pterygium can recur. And like I said, we tend to see them in the tropics, 
And because of that, also we tend to see them generally in slightly younger people around the equator. Um, so your typical guys who work outside, uh, you know, they sell things on the road outside, or they work as welders, some of the dual mechanics, we tend to see it in fairly young ages here. Okay. Um, Rhinosporidiosis is not a tumor as such. Um, it's, it's, it's a parasitic lesion that presents as a tumor. And this was a case again I had from my study. And the parasite is Rhinosporidium. So we thought it was a tumor and we excised it and sent it to pathology. And it's actually the pathologist who made this diagnosis and we published this article. So you can see this sporangia. And then you can see that stratified appearance of the conjunctiva. Uh, conjunctiva is a bit like skin. So sometimes you get things like retepex that go uh, into, into the deeper tissues like you see here. Uh, so somebody is asking, what's the difference between the conjunctiva and the sclera? Good question. Sclera is the white of the eye. So if you can see my pointer, sclera is that white you see there. Conjunctiva is actually above it, but because it's translucent, we can see through it. So the sclera is a coat of the eye and the conjunctiva is a covering on it. So the treatment for this is excision. Uh, they rarely ever recur. So this one we excised, uh, we did not see it come again. These are really rare. Um, Epibulba damoids, you probably see them in the pediatric clinics. Uh, if I see somebody with an Epibulba damoid, the only reason I showed this is if you see this one, you better think of somebody who's got golden heart syndrome. So they tend to have this bulba thing that you see on the eye and golden heart syndrome, they have this preauricular skin tags on the side. Uh, if you haven't done so in pediatrics, I'm sure you cover golden and Richard Collins. Dermolipomas, not so common. Um, they look like fatty tissue because they contain fatty tissue. Uh, you can see it looks whitish, reddish. Uh, they may or not have hair. They behave like dermoids and they can extend onto the limbus. Uh, generally, don't treat this, don't, don't worry about it. Unless it's really bothering somebody cosmetically that needs surgery, then I'll send to an ophthalmologist. But even if you send this patient to me, I'll generally talk them out of having surgery. Then the premalignant and malignant ones. So the most common premalignant lesion we see in Kenya is actinic keratosis. It presents as these plaques of white lesions on the conjunctiva. And those plaques stain with a stain called toluidin bloom, which is what you see below here. Um, it's very interesting because these patients can sometimes be seen and some people suspect that it's a pterygium or you know, there's some inflammation. They are not sure and they give them steroids. And when you give them steroids, these things disappear. Or some patients report that when they rub the eye, this thing falls off. So the worst thing about this is, especially when they fall off, somebody can ignore it. Uh, but they can transform to ocular surface squamous neoplasia. So their treatment is the same as the ocular surface. You ex excise it and give anti-metabolites. Ocular surface squamous neoplasia, there can be different types and actually they can be very difficult to distinguish from benign lesions. You see the one on the top left, it really looks like the actinic keratosis I just showed you. Then the one on the right is slightly bigger, but notice also it's pigmented. So some people think, may think that's a nevus. Uh, some can be quite large. This one is almost looking like a grip on the eyeball itself. And some of course can be huge debilitating orbital tumors that fill up the whole orbit. It's very common in Africa and Asia. And the incidence of this disease went dramatically up after the onset of HIV. The typical mean age from the study I did is 41 years. Two thirds of our patients were females, three quarters of them are HIV infected. So if, if I see this lesion in somebody, test them for HIV. The other risk factors are exposure to UV radiation, um, HIV of course, particularly we found those who are not taking ARTs seem to be at higher risk. Uh, 
than those who are HIV infected but are taking ARTs. Human papilloma virus is also implicated, it's been found in those tissues and diseases like xeroderma pigmentosum and albinism. So the treatment is surgical excision, that's the mainstay of treatment. You can either give adjuvant chemotherapy or cryotherapy or radiotherapy to kill the remaining tumor cells, uh, close the defect by primary closure, or you can use uh, amniotic membrane grafts. When they are very large, like the picture I showed you on the bottom left here, bottom right, sorry, uh, those patients, uh, we have no choice. We do external, we exenterate, that's removing everything in the orbit, including the periosteum of the bone. And then we give them external beam radiotherapy, but I have never been convinced that this radiation works. We actually did a study with one of my postgraduates recently and compared people who had radiotherapy and those who did not. And after one year, the mortality was the same in both groups. So we are not sure that it actually makes a big difference. Kaposi sarcoma, this used to be quite common once we started getting a lot of HIV, but fortunately I must say, I'm happy to say with the use of uh, antiretrovirals, this has gone down. We rarely ever see one. I don't think I've seen a Kaposi in the last three years or so. Last one I remember may have been three years ago. So they are not very common, but they are these fleshy looking vascular tumors, which can be anywhere on the bulbar conjunctiva, on the tarsal conjunctiva, as you see this one, some can occur on the lead margin, as you see there, and another one on the lead margin. Uh, they were very common with HIV and they were treated by excision and radiotherapy. And we used to inject intralesion or been blasting in these tumors. Fortunately, we don't see them anymore. They seem to have gone with uh, ART. And I'm quite happy to say that. I don't want to see these kind of things again because they didn't respond very well to treatment. And maybe it is that by the time we saw these patients, they had so many other, you know, systemic effects from each other. So most patients with Kaposi and with CMV retinitis. Conjunctival lymphoma in tumor like salmon. So there's a big one there. There's a smaller one there. Uh, usually bilateral uh, that you should think about. So this is not a patient to treat locally. If I see this lesion, I always send them to the oncologist because they need chemotherapy. And for the eye, we just excise the lesion and give intralesion interference. Primary acquired melanosis, uh, not very common in Africans, but it's important for you to know because like I say, when you work in some of these places where you may have a lot of white populations, uh, then you might see some of these conditions. The white of the eye looks really brown. You see this kind of brownness in an African, it's quite common. But in a white person with this kind of brown, actually they'll come to you because they think something is wrong. So that's very common, primary acquired melanosis. Typically starts in your bodies. Um, it can expand or just stay the same for a long time. But the worst thing about them is they can become malignant and you can't predict. So especially when you start seeing lesions around the junction here of the skin and the conjunctiva, those multiple lesions, uh, there are some cluster of factors we consider risk factors for transformation. Uh, when you see those, then you need to excise the lesion. When they turn malignant, you get melanoma. So conjunctival melanoma is this big, brown, blackish looking tumor, again, very rare in Africans. Um, some are melanotic, they can be large, but they look white and uh, they need chemotherapy and excision. And the chance for mortality also exists. So we should never ignore that. Good, so to summarize, it's been a long lecture, I understand. We recapped on the anatomy of the conjunctiva. Remember, it's a stratified squamous epithelium, which is exposed a lot to the environment. It has a blood supply, so it's also prone to systemic diseases, which can get there by the blood supply. The functions of the conjunctiva, to attach the eyeball, to provide mucin to stabilize the tears and immunological functions. So if you don't have a function in conjunctiva, you'll end up with a dry eye, and a dry eye increases the risk of inflammation, the epithelial defects and infection. 
uh, immunological defense is important. So once the conjunctiva is not working well, you compromise the secret of the IgA and lymphocytes, and uh, that can also be a problem. So we talked about the different insults, the radiation, wind, and chemicals. And I think through the lecture, you've seen that we've covered quite a lot of these. Uh, we saw how the conjunctiva responds to inflammation, and I think now you can see from the pictures that we looked at, the pattern is generally the same. The eye will be red, it might feel warm, the conjunctiva is swollen, there's a lot of discharge and pain. And then we discuss some common diseases. Um, so I will end there. And uh, just looking through, I can see that somebody said in IMED, we were told to check anemia in the conjunctiva and jaundice in the sclera. How is that possible? Wow, I wish the physicians were here to show you. You see, anemia just means you have low HB. So the conjunctiva has some blood vessels, which you don't often see much. The sclera also has some blood vessels, but typically in a patient with anemia, then you will not even see those blood vessels so at all. So they look very pale. Um, when you see jaundice, jaundice again is bilirubin accumulating in the blood. And so you tend to see tissue staining in both the sclera and the conjunctiva. But remember, the conjunctiva is a translucent structure. So quite often when people look, they'll say it's on the sclera or the conjunctiva, but you can see through that. I can't describe that. I think it's probably easier seen in a real patient than, than talked about. And somebody is asking, how are the success rates of the surgeries I talked about? That's a loaded question. And it was actually the reason I did that PhD. We used to excise a lot of these tumors and we were finding them recurring in, I would say 40 to 50% of these lesions, actually maybe even more. Half to two thirds would recur within three months, which I found very disturbing. And some of them would come by the time the lesion recurs, the mass is so big, we have to remove the whole eye. And for me, that was disturbing. You know, as an ophthalmologist, my training was to preserve vision. So the success rates were very poor. And so part of the work I did for my PhD was actually to test whether if we excise and give anti-metabolites like 5-FU, can we reduce the recurrence? And so in my trial, the group that did not have meta, uh, meta anti-metabolite had a recurrence within, uh, within a year, although most of them recurred within three months, about 36%. But the group that had anti-metabolites, the recurrence was actually 10%. Uh, so yes, uh, recurrence now can be reduced by the use of antimetabolites, which is why you notice I was talking about antimetabolites quite a lot. Uh, Somebody is asking, why is it called pyogenic granuloma if it doesn't present that way? Good question, and I wish I knew who to ask that. I don't know where these names come from. Um, a lot of names of diseases and signs um, were discovered or described in the 19th century. And so people are just describing what they saw. So when you see people talking about woody hardness on the skin and things like that, later on, as people learn what they are, they are changing the names, but some don't change very often. And yes, pyogenic granuloma is one of those. I don't know why it was called pyogenic granuloma. So I think we still have another minute for any comment or 